dismissed to Children's Church. Well, the Holy Spirit, let's think about that for a moment. In the church today, the Holy Spirit is abused or much abused in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, many if not most churches tend to treat the Holy Spirit like a genie in a bottle or some mystic force to be commanded or a magic formula. In each instance, the Holy Spirit is seen as a way to have our every wish and desire granted or fulfilled. Then on the other hand, you have churches where the Spirit is practically ignored and for all intents and purposes, the Christian life is left for us to live under our own strength and abilities. Obviously, both uh, ends of those, that spectrum are wrong, biblically speaking. The, the, the biblical view of the Holy Spirit is that of a real person. In fact, He is a member of the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, shares all of the attributes and power that the triune Godhead contains. But even closer to home, I think, for us is that uh, He indwells each individual believer. He has baptized each one of us into the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and raised us to live new life. He is giving us that new life and the power uh, to each of us that enables us to live what is an impossible life, that is the God-pleasing life. And it is the Holy Spirit Himself sent from the Lord Jesus Christ and sent from God the Father who empowers us and enables us to live the life that God would have us live. So we're going to be looking at that a bit this morning as we walk through our study of uh, First Thessalonians. And just to remind us, all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And we need to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, accurately handling that word of truth. And finally, we need to prove ourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. In other words, we allow the Spirit to have His work in our lives using the word of God uh, to cause us to live the life God would approve of. So we're still looking at Christian living in the meantime, attitudes and actions in verses 16 through 22 of this final chapter of the book of 1 Thessalonians. So if you would, if you haven't already, turn your Bibles to that passage and we'll dig into it together. And we'll begin by reading. We'll go ahead and read that um, from verse 12 to verse 22. So in verse 12, again, Paul says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you today needing the ministry of your Holy Spirit to work in us, to help us to understand the message that you've given to us here. 
Help us to each be able to apply it to our own lives. And Father, help us to live in obedience to it. Uh, Lord, we live in a world that is getting darker every minute of every day, and we pray that you would help us to be the light of the world, the salt of the, of the earth. Help us to fulfill the works you have for each of us, and thus bring you glory and honor, regardless of whether our message is accepted or rejected. Help us to live holy lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So once again, here's where we've been. We're in the second section looking at the practical instructions. We've been through everything and now come down to this final, actually two sections that I've put together under the heading of concerning church relationships. And so we've been walking through that together. Last week we began looking at this particular section, beginning verse 16, going through verse 22. We saw uh, that Paul is teaching us or teaching the church in Thessalonica about a proper attitudes and proper actions. And just quickly by way of review, those proper attitudes, if you remember, is that idea of paradoxical joy in verse 16, where we are called to always be rejoicing regardless of our circumstances. Then secondly, in verse 17, he says that we need to constantly uh, be in prayer. And so again, it's not that we have to pray every moment of every day, but it's to always be prepared uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, move into prayer for whatever uh, confronts us at that day. Always have an attitude of prayerfulness. Be, be ready to pray. And then in verse 18, a perpetual thanks, where he says that uh, uh, give thanks in all things. And uh, we elders were meeting Tuesday and we got to discussing this and how difficult this section of Scripture is, is it not? To, to always be rejoicing, to always be in a, a state or readiness for prayer, uh, to in everything give thanks regardless uh, of what the circumstances may be. Uh, because I know some of you are like me, that when a, a difficult circumstance comes along, my natural reaction is to become frustrated or angry or whatever. I mean, that's that's a natural thing. Um, but we're called to live in an opposite manner. And so that's why we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit working in us to remind us in those moments that, hey, remember the word says, uh, rejoice always, always give thanks, be ready for prayer, those type of things, because it doesn't come naturally to us. But what we find then at the end of verse 18 is that when we do these things, we are fulfilling God's will. So again, that, that last phrase, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, includes these three things. Paradoxical joy, constant prayer, and perpetual thanks. Now it goes beyond that, of course, because we looked back in chapter 4. We remember he had some other comments about what God's will is for our life. But in this section, he focuses in on these three things. But I think we could also say what comes after this is also a fulfilling of God's will. And so that's where we come into this section, proper actions in verses 19 through 22. And what we see then, the proper response to the Holy Spirit and the proper response to prophecies. Okay, so obviously we want to begin with verse 19. So let's look at this. The Spirit do not quench. That's what he says. Okay, so remember what he's doing here is he's fronting the, the verb with the Spirit to focus in, to, to uh, um, really emphasize that it is the Spirit. We must not quench the Spirit. All right, so what does it mean to quench the Spirit, right? If we're going to have a proper response to the Spirit, we need to know what it means to quench the Spirit. Well, first of all, we see that this metaphor of uh, com comparing the Spirit with fire uh, runs throughout Scripture, or at least uh, in several places through Scripture. For instance, and I just really discovered this this week, uh, going through my daily uh, Bible reading, uh, and some of you are doing that, you, we, the uh, Bible plan that we put out every year, it takes us through the whole Bible in one year. Hopefully some of you read this also this week, but 
I recognize this in Isaiah 4, verse 4, where the Lord through Isaiah says, When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. So the spirit pictured here as one who, who wipes away or burns away the sin of Israel in the future. And that's part of his ministry in us to help us, first of all, when we're born again at that moment, our slate has been wiped clean in the eyes of God. But we have that day-to-day -day sinfulness that we have to deal with, and it is the Spirit's work in us that helps us to step-by-step, day-by-day, moment-by-moment overcome uh, that sin pattern that we've developed in our lives. And we see the same thing in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, and again, uh, the uh, parallel scripture in Luke chapter 3, 16. But in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is speaking. Actually, John is speaking. I'm sorry. John is speaking. And in verse 11, John says, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then again, Acts chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, we see the picture of the tongues of fire uh, coming down upon the, the uh, disciples of Jesus, and, and that's in conjunction with the work of the Holy Spirit there. And then again, in Revelation 4 and verse 5, it speaks of the, the seven lampstands, or the, the, the fire burning on the seven lampstands being the seven spirits of God, which pictures the Holy Spirit in His fullness, Okay. And so that, that metaphor runs through Scripture of the Holy Spirit being compared to fire. And so what we find here is present tense, do not quench the Spirit. So the question is, uh, the way the, the language works, it's either warning them to stop doing what they have been doing. So, so in other words, stop quenching the Holy Spirit. Or it can also mean uh, just a warning against a possible action. So some commentators believe that what's going on in the church of Thessalonica is the exact opposite of what went on in the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was going crazy with people so-called speaking in tongues and, and things like that, so-called manifestations of the work of the Spirit. And Paul had to chastise them for the abuse that was taking place in that church concerning the work of the Spirit uh, in, in the church. Some believe that what Paul is alluding to here in this verse, verse 19, is the opposite is going on in the church in Thessalonica, that, that they're not allowing people or prophets to speak or taking the prophecies and rejecting them out of hand. All right? The problem is we simply have no idea what's going on at this point. Maybe that's happening, maybe it's not. I, I think it's really more conjecture than anything else. I think this is simply a message to the church to not quench the Holy Spirit. There's a possibility of quenching the Spirit, so don't do it, all right? And so it, it's probably a warning against a possible action, which is to quench, or uh, another way of looking at it is to stifle the Spirit's activity, or to suppress His activity. We can't uh, quench Him personally. In other words, there's, there's no dousing. There's no putting out the Holy Spirit. He's, a, he's the third person of the Godhead, right? So He's, he's uh, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, 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 and, and the other omni, whatever it is. Uh, and all the other great characteristics just went blank. Uh, it's a story of my life, of, of, the, of God, so he is God. He is uh, part of the Godhead. So you can't get rid of him. You can't douse him like a, like a, a flame, a, a, a literal flame, and put him out. And so what is actually going on here is how Lewis Berry Chafer described it. The Spirit is quenched by any unyieldedness to the revealed will of God. So we, we read the Scripture, okay, and we, we, we learn what a portion of Scripture says, and we refuse to follow it. We refuse, we refuse to rejoice always. Uh, we refuse to uh, give thanks in everything. 
Okay, so in doing so, we quench the Holy Spirit. He goes on and says, it is simply saying no to God. And so it's closely related to the motives of the divine appointments for service. Though the Spirit may be quenched as well by any resistance of the providence of God in the life, it does not imply that He is extinguished or that he withdraws. It is rather the act of resisting the Spirit. It is, it is suppressing or resisting or stifling the Spirit's work in our life by, as he says, unyieldedness. And we all know what yield means. Uh, it, well, let me think about that for a moment. Drivers in Lubbock don't know what yield means, but, but we, know what, what, we know what it means, right? Uh, we, we yield the right of way to someone else. In our lives then, we yield the right of way in our lives to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so when we're in a situation uh, that calls for remembering a principle or a passage from the Word of God, the Holy Spirit brings that to mind and we have that choice. Follow what the Holy Spirit has remind us, reminded us of from the Word of God, the God-breathed Word, or say, no, I'm going to follow this path instead. And in doing that, then we quench the Spirit. We stifle His work in our lives. And that's uh, just a little side note. That's where 1 John 1, 9 comes in again. When we realize what we've done, we confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, right? Okay? So finally then, we see that... Um, quenching the spirit is rejecting his instruction right and so it's tied into what we find next now again well let's just walk through this uh, we see the proper response to prophecies now you see the verse there do not despise prophetic utterances that that utterances is really an addition um, but it's a necessary addition what he's saying here is when a prophecy has been uttered, don't just simply reject it out of hand or reject it disdainfully, all right? But we have to decide what a prophetic utterance is. So let's just look at this together. Prophecies do not despise. And so we have to ask ourselves, first of all, what is a prophecy or what is he speaking of here? And secondly, what does it mean to despise those prophecies, Okay. First of all, the definition of the Greek word for prophecies is the gift of interpreting divine will or purpose. Now, there are other definitions, but I think this is the one that fits here. The gift of interpreting divine will or purpose. Now, at the time of writing 1 Thess uh, Thessalonians, you remember this is before, uh, uh, several years before um, his writing of First and Second Corinthians. And at that time, uh, the ministry of the Spirit through the workings of, of the sign gifts, such as speaking in tongues or prophecies, could still be in effect, all right? And so there is a chance that what he's speaking of here is divine uh, foretelling, for, foretelling something of a future event. We walk through the book of Acts and we see, for instance, as Paul is headed to uh, Rome, uh, or, or actually headed to Jerusalem, I think it was, Rome or Jerusalem. And of course, now I'm getting myself confused. Um, but a, a prophet steps up and takes Paul's belt and binds his hands and feet and says, this is what's going to happen to you if you continue on this planned journey. And it was a prophecy given to him by the Holy Spirit. Now, why? Uh, we don't know. It doesn't matter. Paul ignored it because he knew what was waiting for him. So there's a possibility that what Paul is speaking of here in uh, um, despising prophetic utterances is the idea of someone coming into the church with a message from God that had not yet been given concerning some future event. Sort of like the book of Revelation. John writing the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And he writes about the future. Okay? He may be speaking of this. However, for the vast majority of what we find uh, in, in Scripture or in the New Testament is that the, the, the idea is on instruction and guidance, not on predictive prophetic utterances. So if you turn back to Acts 
chapter, well, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to go to Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, okay, this is the Spirit speaking to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. All right? And what was the work to which he had called Barnabas and Saul, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paul? He called them to be missionaries, to share the gospel, not to go out and preach uh, prophecies concerning the future, although Paul, I'm sure, did that, and we see passages that could allude to that. Uh, but he, their main job was to go and proclaim the gospel, to lead people to salvation in Jesus Christ, and to instruct them in the way of the Lord. And so that probably, um, and I say probably, I'm sure, uh, I'm just not thinking of a passage right now where Paul actually prophesied, except, for instance, when he wrote to Timothy uh, concerning the, the last days. Um, but his main job was to instruct them to build them up in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Paul is probably speaking here of uh, someone standing up and proclaiming the message of the Lord in the congregation. And if you remember when we looked at the book of first and second books of first and second Corinthians, we saw that uh, he says this is the proper way to conduct a worship service. You let one person stand up and prophesy at a time, one person at a time, and then someone else stands up and interprets, right? Uh, and so together you decide if the message is accurate, if it's biblical. Um, and so he's probably speaking more along the lines of the exposition of the message of God and not uh, predictive prophecies. Now, in that word despise, the Greek word literally means to have no use for something as beneath consideration or to reject something disdainfully. So in other words, look at it this way. The, the, uh, the leader... Uh, a shepherd of the church in Thessalonica after Paul leaves, he stands up and he's expounding upon the word of the Lord and, and, and somebody just chooses, I just reject the message. Okay, that, that's probably a little overboard, but that's kind of the idea that Paul is giving here. So when the message is conveyed uh, from the Lord and people just simply say, I reject that, what, what is the um, chain reaction there. Well, it's to quench the spirit. It's to reject the message that he has given, and therefore you're not going to yield to the message, and so you are quenching the spirit. But he goes on and says in verse 21, but everything examined thoroughly. Everything what? Everything brought thus saith the Lord. So someone stands up and begins to proclaim the message, and what do we find? test it. Don't just accept it, right? So that word means to test everything for its authenticity or its value, okay? And we see uh, that, again, it's in the present tense. This time, it's, it's, it's probably telling them to make sure, if you're not doing it, to start doing it. And he says, to continually be examining the message. So every Sunday morning when we come together, whether it's in Sunday school or if, if I'm up here teaching, you need to examine what I'm saying with against the word of the Lord. And is what I'm saying accurate? Is it correctly conveying the message that scripture is giving? And it's something we can never let our guard down. And that's a tendency that we have in the church is to, oh, I really like so-and-so's teaching, so I'm just going to sit and listen. And we don't listen with a critical ear. And when, when I use the word critical, I'm not saying negatively critical. I'm saying examine, test what the teacher is saying. What, how does it measure up with what Scripture teaches? Is he teaching accurately or is he coming up with some uh, false doctrine or is something off in what he's teaching. And so scripture then is the criterion for, uh, by which we judge someone's teaching or a prophetic utterance. Okay, And we have that example uh, with the, the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. We've read this before. 
But in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, now these uh, Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, look at that, daily, to see whether these things were so. So Paul comes along, he's teaching, and then they go back and, and examine what he has said with what they find in uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Is he telling the truth? They received it eagerly, but they didn't just receive it ignorantly. They tested it. They examined it to make sure it was accurate. And this is a product of the Spirit's ministry. Again, we're talking about the Spirit, uh, not quenching the Spirit. This is a product of the Spirit's ministry. So in 1 John, in particular, I think gives us a great example of what John says about this situation. He says, um, But now you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. He is a liar, but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. So what He's telling us here is that we have an anointing from the Holy Spirit and we're able or capable of taking what has been said and examining the Scriptures uh, to see if it's accurate. And I have another note to myself in here uh, to look at John, uh, for, excuse me, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, which may, is even a more plain statement, I believe. He says in, in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay? So that matches up perfectly with what Paul is saying. So when John uses that word spirit there, he's referring to the message that is coming from these prophets, whether they be true prophets or false prophets. But he says, test them all. And so we as believers must examine everything carefully. And what we find in the church, at least in the United States today, is that Christians are the most gullible people on the planet. Just check any Christian bookstore. Serious. Check any Christian bookstore. See what the bestseller is. It's probably going to be something about the Holy Spirit wants to serve you uh, and give you everything that you ever desired or something similar to that. A and we're just gullible. On the other end of the spectrum, we, we need to follow what Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 8, where Jesus talks about the, the, the people of this world are, are wiser, more wise uh, than the children of the kingdom. Let me turn over there and just read that to you in uh, Luke chapter 16. He, Jesus says, and is uh, speaking of um, the uh, the uh, the wise servants. Um, Jesus ends it. That's not the right passage. Yes, it is. I was looking at the wrong verse. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. And here's what Jesus says: For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Okay? And so what he's telling us is that uh, other, elsewhere he says to be harmless, uh, to be shrewd as a serpent and harmless as doves, right? And so what Jesus is saying is that uh, we need to be wise in living in this life, whatever the case may be. In this instance, Paul is saying that we as believers must exercise wisdom. We must exercise shrewdness, as Jesus would say, uh, in examining everything. And don't just, somebody said one time, and, and I'm sure I've repeated it, but you just, all you got to do is stamp the word Christian on something and we'll buy it. Because we're so lacking in wisdom in some cases. 
Now, when I say we, obviously I'm not speaking of any of you, obviously, because you're all wise and wise acres maybe, but anyway. All right. So when we examine everything, what are we supposed to do? Well, he says the good hold fast. That word good there is speaking of that which is morally or ethically good or uh, beneficial to us as believers. And when we hear the word proclaimed, we examine it, we make sure that it's accurate, and then we hold on to it. On the other side, he says, from every type of evil, hold yourselves back. So on the one hand, we're to hold fast the good. On the other hand, we're to hold ourselves back from that which is evil, whatever it may be. And that literally means any type of evil. The old uh, King James says, uh, all appearance of evil. And I always liked that translation, all, anything that appears the slightest bit evil. But we also have to remember that something may appear to be good, but upon closer examination, we find it's not, right? And so that's the importance of examining everything. That way we can find out what is good and hold on to it tightly. In, in, in the other case, then, we find out what is evil and we hold ourselves back away from it. And that's what Paul is teaching us here then. All right? So the proper actions, we see the proper response to the Spirit, proper response to prophecies. So just a quick review, 16 through 18, we see proper attitudes of paradoxical joy, of constant prayer and perpetual thanks. And in doing this, we're fulfilling God's will. And I think that goes on into our proper actions. We fulfill God's will as we live in accordance with what Paul has taught. All right? So we said there are 15 imperatives in these verses. And let's look at them once again uh, just to remind ourselves what Paul has taught here. First of all, we are to live in peace with each other. Secondly, we're to admonish, warn, instruct those who are living unruly lives. We are to encourage the discouraged. We are to help the helpless. We're to be patient with everyone, especially your pastor. But uh, we are to always be watching to make sure that no one repays evil with evil. We're to always seek what is good for each other and all men. We're to always rejoice. We're to constantly be prepared to pray. We're to give thanks in all things. We're to never quench the Spirit. That's probably the hardest thing on the list. We're not to despise prophecies. Uh, we're to examine everything closely and from that, we are to hold fast to what is good. But from every type of evil, we're to hold ourselves back. And so that's what we find uh, in this passage from uh, the Apostle Paul. Now, just quickly, I'll say this. Uh, there's nothing in here uh, for the lost. Uh, because there's only one thing you can do in obedience to God in your present state. And that is believe in the Lord Jesus. Because in our natural born state, we're all sinners uh, by our very nature. And that separates us from God. Our nature of sinfulness separates us from God. And if we are to die in that state, the only option is for God to send us to a place that he prepared for Satan and his demons. It's a place that we call hell. It's the lake of fire, a place of torment. Uh, and it will last for all eternity without end. That's the promise. That's, that's the only way you're going if you're here or if you're online watching and have never put your faith in Christ. And there's nothing we can do. And so God did it for us. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became a human being and walked among us. He died a cruel death on the cross, being rejected by His own creation. He paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again, is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he offers salvation, the forgiveness of sin, simply by trusting in him. And if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I would plead with you to do it at this moment. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that we've handled it correctly this morning. We pray that you will receive glory from the, the, our time together. Lord, it seems pretty straightforward how we are to apply these um, imperatives, these directives to ourselves. It's also pretty clear, Lord, that it's humanly impossible and we call upon the Holy Spirit's ministry to help us to yield to you. Help us to yield to your leading through the word of God and help us to live in obedience. And when we fail, when we quench you, Holy Spirit, when we grieve you, we pray that you help us to confess those sins and to get up and follow you. And help us each day to become more and more like Christ as we try to live for you in this day and age. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with me?